Is there anybody who's not signed the clipboard reaching the loss? Is anybody not signed? Anybody not, uh, anybody not put their email address down? Anybody who's not been here uh, Sunday or Monday, or maybe you missed it last night? Anybody who's not already put their email address on the clipboard, please do so, because tomorrow you'll get your first email. You don't want to miss these. And so this is important part of our training. Um, we are not a... We're not a one-and-done school. We didn't come to provide eight lectures and leave. We came to till the soil and provide some training for an actionable curriculum that um, we're going to leave with you, and especially your elders, deacons, and preachers tonight. And so the work is just getting started. But if we don't have email addresses, it's hard to get you involved. And so we need to send you information. So please do that. To, um, make sure you have that down. You will get your email, your first email tomorrow. Um, if you do not, two things could be um, causing it. Number one, we couldn't read your writing. Number two, we mistyped it. Or number three, it went to spam. So check your spam folder. And that is sometimes the cause of email um, loss. So uh, very good. Good. Give another minute or two, and then we'll get started. I'm going to speak from the floor tonight, so the audio-visual booth will, will know. I'll be speaking from the floor tonight. So the ladies are in the fellowship hall, and so if you're looking for the ladies, um, I know the men are a little bit ugly, and uh, we're kind of scary. I did? Okay. I always tell the... The men, when we knock doors, we never go alone. We always take a lady because uh, they're not going to open the door for you. And, uh, and even better yet, take a child. It's almost foolproof. They'll open the door. And they won't yell at you. So uh, most of the time. All right. Does everybody have their Evangelism Simplified Guidebook? If you do, um, you can you can actually turn in it in the the guidebook to uh, one of the latter pages. I believe it's 124. I can borrow. I can I borrow a guidebook here? I think it's it's one. Well, it's not 124. We're close to it. It would be number. One twenty three. 123. Page 123, and that will give you a general guide of our lesson tonight, page 123. Now, in the previous pages, those points are explained. And so, as, as one of the elders noted last night, they said, if you'll just read this textbook, you'll get a pretty good idea about what we're teaching in this seminar, because it's almost verbatim. And, um, and after you do a seminar 200 times, you about memorize it word for word. In fact, if I lost my voice, my son would come up here and just just pick off where I left off, and he probably wouldn't miss a word. And uh, so we we uh, we do try to keep things structured and synced together. We have some exciting things that are going on in our school. Um, we have uh, really worked hard to provide um, churches a simple path forward. Um, it's not complicated. What you're about to embark upon is not hard to understand but it will take incredible willpower. Um, you're excited, you're motivated, you're ready to go, uh, but you're going you're gonna to come face to face with the brethren. The brethren don't change easily. And cultural change is the hardest change for a church to experience. Um, it's easier to break a habit than to change culture. It takes 30 days to break a habit. It takes a year or longer to change a culture. And so you have to be very persistent, and uh, you have to understand that some days are going to be better than others. 
but this is going to be the most difficult thing this church has ever done. I'm just going to I'm just going to be honest with you. Um, what we're what we're talking about is is not a simple. It's not an easy path. Um, it's easy to stay in the status quo. Now, because David has done such a great job tilling the soil here, I believe this church is, I believe it's poised to soar like an eagle. And, uh, and I believe that there's great things ahead for this church. But that doesn't mean it's going to be an easy path. So what we're going to talk about tonight is, is, is the activation of the principles that we've been teaching in our seminar. And I, I do believe they, they will make a huge difference um, in this church. So it was 2020, and I was uh, we were coming up on August. So we started traveling again June 1st, went to Covington, Tennessee, did our first evangelism seminar during COVID. We shut down from the second week of March until the end of May. I called the next church on the list. His name's Wayne Dalrymple. He's one of the elders. I said, Brother Wayne, there hasn't been a baptism in two and a half months. And I said, um, my family's coming to train soul winners. And he said, Rob, we, we just opened up. I said, I, I realized that. I said, we're coming. He said, Rob, I can't guarantee there'll be a soul that's in there. And I said, that's all right. I said, if there's one person who shows up, we're going to train soul winners. So we showed up at Covington. Fifty members showed up at that church. And they spread all over the church building. I mean, it, it was a tense time in this country. There was a lot of unknowns, more unknowns at that point than now. And uh, But we spread out and we trained. We went forward, 32 churches. We traveled this nation and we trained and we trained. And we were on the road living out of a suitcase. It was an interesting time. We'd sometimes be the only one on the road. And we would, uh, we would pull into a hotel. And maybe it was the only hotel open. And there were several times we, we went into a Holiday Inn. And we were the only, only people in this, this 12, 13-story hotel. And... Um, and uh, we looked out in the parking lot one evening, and we literally were the only car in the parking lot besides just a few workers. And uh, we were in Odessa, Texas, Midland, Texas. It was a very strange time. And, uh, but we were training, training churches. So we got to about August, and again, we hadn't seen home for a while. And I looked at my wife, and I said, honey, our anniversary is coming up. I said, you know, we deserve a little break. I said, we're going to be in St. Mary's, Georgia. And I said, uh, why don't we just show up a few days early and we'll take a little anniversary trip, you know, and, and it takes some time and uh, just relax. And uh, she said, what do you got in mind? I said, honey, I said, I've always wanted to go deep sea fishing. I said, why don't we get a charter and see if we can get out there and, you know, do some deep sea fishing. And she said, you know, I, I'll, I'll go for that. That's a great wife, you know, it's anniversary. <laughs> and so so I, I, I called the uh, I called the local preacher and, and uh, I, I talked to him. I said, brother, I said, um, can you tell me, is there a, is there a charter in, in St. Mary's, Georgia? He said, son, that's the deep sea capital of the world, St. Mary's, Georgia. He said, there are charters everywhere, but uh, you usually got to get them a year in advance. He said, but, he said, it's COVID. He said, and there's hardly anybody going out there. And he said, he said, let me give you a name of a captain, usually booked up solid six months. So he gives me his name and I call him. And he said, son, he said, I got the whole day free. He said, the boat's yours. He says, how many? I said, five. My, my family, my dad. He said, great. So I said, um, I said, well, sir, I said, um, at what time should I meet you after at the dock? He said, uh, three o'clock. I said, a captain, that doesn't give us a lot of time to fish. I mean, I mean, you know, we're, we're getting out there. He said, no, son. He says, three in the morning. I said, okay, three in the morning. I said, all right, captain. I said, uh, I said, tell me, tell me, uh, when I get after three o'clock in the morning, how am I going to know it's you? He said, son, I'll be the only one there. And I said, I right, sounds good. So I, I snuck it in on my wife. I said, no, honey, but we're going to get up about 2 o'clock in the morning. That didn't go over very well. And in any case, uh, we got up at 2 o'clock in the morning. We got the family. We got out down to the dock. And uh, it was the captain, the first mate. His, he had a nice fishing boat. I, I, you know, I, I'm a pilot. I, I see a lot of instrumentation. I mean, it looked like I was walking into the space shuttle. And this guy had more instrumentation on that dash. He had, he had uh, monitors. And I said, wow. I said, Captain, this thing's dipped out. He says, he said, you do want to catch fish, don't you? I said, yes, sir. He said, by the way, what kind of fish you want to catch? I said, the big stuff. He said, now, son, it's going to take a while. I said, that's all right. I said, I've got all day. And he said, all right, you guys get down in there, hunker down. He says, go to sleep. He said, I'll let you know when you need to get up. So sure enough, we, we, uh, we idle out, you know, in the no-wake zone. We get out there, and he just he, he, he opens the throttle up and and it wasn't 30 minutes. I was I was out. You know, you couldn't see a thing. I mean, you know, he had everything lined up. So we're heading out there and 
and hours and hours and hours. And finally, the sun you know, starts to peek through the, the horizon. And, um, you know, it's coming up. And he throttles back. He says, all right, everybody. He's looking at all this instrumentation. He says, that's it. That's it right here. He says, uh, catch your bait. We need catch bait. So we, we have these, these poles already set up. I mean, he's got everything just set up and lined up. And I, I believe the name for triple hooks, multiple hooks on the line, is that what we call it? So we throw him in there, you know. And he's looking at these, these monitors, and he starts counting down. He says, a five, four, three, two, one. Pull him up. And, I, and I, I, we pull our line. We're all pull. Then I, I beat fish all over my hook. I said, hey, Captain, how did you do that? He says, he says, you paid for a charter, didn't you? I said, yes, sir. He says, you want to catch fish, don't you? I said, yes, sir. He said, put it in the live well. So we took him out, and, you know, and this first mate, I mean, he's, a, he's an ex-Marine. I mean, every, every word the captain says, he, he hangs on it. Whatever the captain says, it's immediately, immediately followed. And so we're putting everything down, and, and everything's in. He said, all right, everybody, I'd say we'll be another hour or two from what you want to catch. He said, just hunker down, and I'll let you know. So we hunker down again, you know, and he opens a throttle up. And we start going out. So we're going out even further now. I mean, we're way out there in the, in the, um, in the Atlantic. And he throttles it back, right? And he's looking on these monitors. And I notice, I mean, he's watching. He said, there it is. He said, all right. He says, first mate. And uh, he said, we got one. He said, who, who wants to go first? And nobody spoke up. So I raised my hand and said, I'll go first. First mate, buckle him in. But I've never been buckled in before to catch a fish. So he puts me on this chair, and he literally harnesses me in. So I'm harnessed in now, and, I, and, and this pole is as big as my arm, you know. And it's a, he said, all right, get it out there. And he said, all about the, uh, 75 yards or so, for 50 yards. He's, he's counting down. I mean, he's, it's precise. Five, you know, 6 o'clock right about in there, you know. And he said, all right, there it is, there it is. And he starts counting down again. He's got 10, 9, and he's got 7, six. He says, right there. And all of a sudden, he, my pole goes, zzzz. And I go, whoa, he said, now, son, hold it tight. And I'm holding, he said, son, it's big, son. He said, hold it tight. And I'm holding, he said, here's what you need to do. You need to lean it back. He says, and as you go forward, I want you to reel. Click, 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 reel, look, click, click. So I'm doing all what he tells me. I'm listening intensely to him. He knows what he's doing. He's a master at his trade. He's taking a lifetime to study it. He never complains when he has to get up at 2 o'clock in the morning. He doesn't complain when he has to buy the best gear, the best product. He, he watches YouTube. He spent his whole life. He's dedicated to it. And he's good at it. And we pulled that fish in the back of that boat. It's huge. And I, I said, I said uh, Captain, what is that? He said, it's, he said uh, son, he said, I'm looking. He, I, he said, it's a kingfish. There's a reason they call it a kingfish. It's king. It's huge. And this thing is mess. I've never seen a fish like this. And it's coming. In. He, I said, how are we going to pull that up? He says, you're not. Come in from the back side. So we're going to pull it in from the back of the boat, you know. And as, as soon as we get it right up to the back of the boat, and on the side of my eye, I catch a glimpse of something. I don't know what it is. It's shining. It sails right out of the water. It takes my fish and slices it in half like hot butter. Half my fish just disappeared. I said, Captain, what, what was that? He said, well, son. We call that a barracuda. He said, there's a reason they're called a barracuda. Now, even though I had half a fish, it was still, it was still this big. And I brought that fish in, and uh, by 2 o'clock that afternoon, we had our limit. Five of us caught our limit. We couldn't catch another fish. That man was good. He spared no expense. He had all the instruments he needed. He studied it. He was the master at his trade. I think some of us in the auditorium tonight are more concerned about fishing for fish than we are fishing for men. I think if some of us tonight would be as excited about going out there and looking for souls as we are as excited about deer hunting. You know, when it comes to the deer hunting, we're prepared. Man, we got our, not just any camera, we got the Wi-Fi camera. And we can sit there at work and we can watch the book come in and out. We know exactly what time to come. We got our automatic feeder set and we're sitting, they're sitting ducks. We get out there, we know, we don't complain when you got to get up at two o'clock in the morning. You don't complain when you got to spend hundreds of dollars on the, the best camouflage out there. And you got the best rifle and you spend, what, two dollars a bullet now for 243 or 30 six. And no one complains. We just do it because you love it.
I wonder what would happen in the Church of Christ if we were passionate about the people in our communities that are lost as we are about our bucks and our fish. Gentlemen, we are men, and men must lead the church. It's time for men to stand and be counted. It's time for the men of the Church of Christ to put their toys aside and understand there are some things more important in this life. I'm not opposed to hunt. I love to hunt. I'm not opposed to fishing. I love to fish. But brethren, there's a time for the men in the church to focus on reaching the lost. Because if we don't reach the lost in our communities, they're lost. And the Church of Christ is not going to grow without you. David paid it will not be the reason this church grows. Neither will Brother Frank or any other elder. It will be because you do your job. Every man stands and is counted and leads his home and his family and decides that soul winning is the most important thing we're going to do. We're not going to play church any longer. We're not going to sit back in our pulpits and play preacher in our office. We're not going to sit, we're not going to sit down and pretend we're being pious and religious. We're going to have a strategy. We're going to enact it. Every member is going to have a job. We're going to have a strategy for success. And we're going to focus the church on their mission. You know, men are mission-minded. When you give a man a mission, get out of his way. He's going to complete it. You know, and my wife knows. She, she'll be over there talking. We're going down the road. She'll talk to me for hours. I probably couldn't repeat a word she said. I'm on a mission. I don't even know what's going on. And the kids, dad's zoned out again. No, dad's on a mission. You know, you've been on a mission before. No, I don't know what's going on around me. I don't even know how I got where I'm at. But I'm so focused on what I'm trying to do. Brethren, this is the most important mission you've ever done. And you can't carry the church on your back. You can't do it on your own. you got to get every member involved. you got to train your members. you got to get the elders leading, the pulpit pushing. And the members have got to activate the plan. And if you miss any of those pieces, it'll fail. I've seen church after church struggle, and I find it's, it's one of those. It's, it's usually one of the two. It's usually one of the two. It's either the preacher's not focused on it. He's got his own pet projects. Or the elders aren't leading. When you put a motivated preacher in the pulpit, and you put an eldership together that's focused on evangelism leading the church, and we are unstoppable. We are the church of Christ. We're a mission. It's the greatest mission in, in life. As much as as much as I love, I love as much as I love my hobbies, and I do, rather than I, I I can I can get distracted. It's easy. We've all been there, and I and I'm, I'm not opposed for you to go out there and man, get the best rifle you can get. I mean, I've got him sitting in my gun safe. I, I prize him. Isn't it nice on a Saturday to pull him out, oil him up, right, and get ready for deer season? My son and I love to hunt. We love to put our orange on. We love to get in our stands. I mean, that doesn't bother me to get up at 2 o'clock. I don't complain. I love it. Why do we complain about getting up for church? Why do we complain about soul winning? Obviously, I'm speaking to the choir tonight. It's Tuesday night. we got young men sitting here. They want to learn how to win souls. I couldn't be more impressed. I couldn't be, I couldn't be, I'm just blown away. But we've got a whole church here. We've got, we got 220 members. We've got to help them come to an understanding that this is the most important thing you're going to do in your life. This is the most important thing any of us will ever do. You've got friends right now, guys. You've got people you guys know, and they're depending on you. You've got people at work, and they're, they don't even know it. You're their lifeline. You got neighbors right now that if you don't do your job, no one's going to do it for you. That's how serious this is. So no one, who's going to stand in the gap? Who's going to do your job for you? Who's going to, who's going to in Lafayette? Who is it in this town? Who at Riverbend is going to do your job? You fail to do your job. There are souls are at stake. I believe we need to focus. Winston Churchill is known as one of the greatest world leaders in modern era. And it's, it's kind of obvious why. He, uh, he was on, the, uh, he was on the, uh, the footstools of a, of a weak leader by the name of Neville Chamberlain. Y'all remember what Neville Chamberlain did? He, he made a peace treaty with Adolf Hitler. It was a disaster. And um, the, the, the morale of the people couldn't be lower. And, and you remember what Hitler did to the treaty, right? He ignored it. He just, he just swept right across France. And, uh, you know, Neville Chamberlain, he's shaking because he knows he's, he's been had. 
and uh, the people have lost confidence in their leadership. And, and, and the bombing raids had started. And, and they were watching Hitler just decimate army after army. And guess who's next? Britain. There's just some water separating them. And the people's morale is low. And so, so uh, there's another man. His name is Winston Churchill. And he sees it. He sniffs it out. He sniffs out weakness. And so he says, he says I've got to make a difference. And so what he does is he goes into the parliament. Now, they have a parliamentary system. It's a little different than our system here. And so you can get a vote of no confidence. You can replace your prime minister literally in, in one day. He walks into the, he walks right in. And he's going to give a speech, one of the greatest speeches in world history. In that speech, this is what he said. He who fails to plan is planning to fail. Gentlemen, I want to know where your plan is. You got a plan for vacation. You got a plan for hunting. We got a plan for school. We got a plan for work. We even got a plan for going to the bathroom. I want to know where our plan is to save souls. Many of our churches are shooting from the hip. That's what we're doing. We're shooting from the hip. We just hope we hit something. You know, I, I, if, if that's your plan, good luck. First couple of years I deer hunted, I kept complaining. I can't. I, I never seen any deer. I thought they were snipe. You know, I thought, there's no deer out here. I mean, this is just. There's, I've never seen anything. I had no plan. You know, I didn't know what I was doing. And I finally went with a real deer hunter. I mean, he took me under his wing. He said, let me show you how it's done. I got a deer. He had a plan. He knew what he was doing. And so there's a big difference in saying, I'm going to evangelize, but we have no plan. Then taking a plan, an actionable plan, and carrying it out. So what I want to do tonight is I'm just going to run through 10 things. I call this the 10-step 10, 10 plan. I'm not going to organize it. I'm not going to, I'm not going to put any X's and O's on the board. We're not going to blow the whistle. So this would be like a training camp. How many of y'all ever play ball? Anybody ever play ball? Raise your hand. Ball players. Okay. You know, training camp. You remember training camp? Man, it's, it's not fun. And uh, I remember the first time I went to my first training camp. And I thought we were going to have some, you know, scrimmage. Man, there was no scrimmaging. It was, it was all about making you as sick as possible. And uh, I, I grew up in South Texas, 103, 4 degree weather. Back then, um, they gave you a salt tablet before you started and no water. Because water was weak. And so they, they'd fire a coach for that today. And so they put you out there for two hours under the hot sun. All you did is run up and down, run, you know, and he's just trying to see who's going to collapse first. You know, and so so that that that's a what we call that training camp, right? Well, I don't want to make anybody sick tonight, but we need training camp. Right? We got to figure out what 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 do we need to focus on? Well, number one, we got to have the tools. Now, I'm not gonna spend a lot of time here. Gentlemen, you understand that at LaFay. This is one of the few churches, I'm, I'm going to say this and, 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 and thank God for it. This is one of the few churches I've ever been to. I walk in and you've got a lot of the supplies sitting there. And most of our churches, there are no supplies. In fact, they, they don't have, they have nothing to reach the lost. And so you have this, you understand this. But a lot of our churches, and this, this church is excluded from this, you know, we have everything we need to open a soup kitchen. Now think about it. We got coffee pots, coffee cups, coffee stirs, coffee mate, coffee creamer. We got we got coffee filters. We got coffee grinds. We got refrigerator, microwave, and oven, and 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 tablecloths, and forks, and knives, and spoons, and table covers, and we have chairs. And we got. We, don't you worry. If 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 the refrigerator goes out, I bet there won't even be an elders meeting to determine if we replace it. I bet you just go do it, right? I mean, we don't need. Should we replace the refrigerator? You know, I've been to some churches, and I've suggested maybe you should have some evangelism materials, and the others said, we'll deliberate about it. But we don't deliberate about refrigerators. So the, the number one thing we need to do is we need to have the equipment to do the job. You can't do the job without the equipment. And so this is, this is fundamental. I'm not going to spend a lot of time here. You guys have done a pretty good job with that. Let's go to number two. You got to put it out there where people can get it. Once again, pretty good job. I walked in. <laughs> First thing, I, I said, this is good. I said, they got evangelism material, step one. Step two, they put it out there where the members can get it. So they got it on the left, they got it on the right. I mean, you know, you don't have to worry about having it hid in the preacher's office, locked away in a filing cabinet. We don't have to worry about, uh, you know, trying to unlock a vault to get to it. And I've literally been to churches exactly like that. Oh, yeah, we've got it. But, it, you know, it's in the coat closet locked away. It's in the preacher's office in a vault. 
He can't get to it. He can't get access to it. In fact, I asked one elder, why is all your evangelism equipment and all your materials locked in a room, literally, and locked in a locker? It was double locked. I just asked. He said, well, we, we don't lock it. Someone might get it. That's literally what he told me. I looked at him. I said, don't you want them to get it? Is, is that the point? Why are we locking it away? And so, so get it out there. So, again, I'm not going to spend a lot of time here. Let's go to number three. Well, here's what we call the evangelism table. So, in a lot of our churches, we recommend you get a table, you throw a tablecloth over it, and you call it the evangelism center. And you put it somewhere where the brethren will have to trip over it to get out of the building. And uh, you make it the centerpiece of your, your auditorium, or your, your, your foyer. You make sure the brethren have access to it. There's a lot of material, most some of what you, you have, but you've got to make it accessible. And they have to understand what it is. So, so this leads us to point number three. Point number three is we've got to train people how to use it. So my, my grandfather was a, he was a incredible mechanic. And he actually, uh, he, he actually raced, uh, he actually raced um, stock cars. My dad worked in the pits. So I grew up in, 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 in you know, an umbrella, you know, I'm going to learn how to work on cars. So when my grandfather passed away. My dad took all his tools and gave them to me. And I mean, I have a, boy, I tell you what, I have a treasure of tools. The problem is that if you don't know how to use the tools, they're, they're, they're worthless. And so if I don't know how to use them, and as a, as a preacher, I just don't get that opportunity often, they're just sitting there. They're, they're empty. They have no value if I don't know how to use them. So we can have all the evangelism tools that we want sitting on tables and shelves. But if your church members do not know how to use them, they're worthless. So if they're scared of back to the Bible, they're not going to use back to the Bible. If they're scared of does it matter, they're not going to use it. If they don't understand, believe the Bible, I promise they're not going to use it. So one of the things that we have to do in our local churches is train our members how to do it. Now, how do you do that? But you don't do it on Monday night. You'll get no participation. You do it on Sunday morning during the pulpit sermon. You make sure those members have that tool in their hand and you take them right through it. You take as much time as needed. You put the PowerPoint on the screen. You have them fill it out and you teach them. You train them. You show them how those tools work. Because if they don't know how to do it, they're not going to do it. Right now in our churches that, that are enrolled in this school, we've got churches taking their youth groups through it. They're taking the adults through it. Some use the, the pulpit, Sunday morning sermon. Some use it in Bible class. But, but we're going to train. And I'm, I'm talking about we're getting third and fourth graders trained how to do it. Fifth and sixth graders are getting trained how to do it. We're even training bi entire Bible camps using it. We had a Bible camp last year. We got it back to the Bible Bible camp. It was full of middle school and teenagers, 27 baptisms. You know what they did all week? We trained them how to use back to the Bible. You know what those young people did? They took those back to the Bibles and they practiced on each other. No emotional utterances, no, um, no spontaneous conversions during, you know, an hour long of singing where you have young people coming forward and uh, they just get you know, worked up. And I'm not opposed to Bible camps and conversions. These conversions were done because they studied the Bible. And not only that, but we had, we had one of the campers take his father who came to work, who wasn't a Christian, and he took back to the Bible. He studies with his dad, and they baptize him. Up. Why aren't we training our youth how to? Why aren't we training them how to do Bible studies? How many conversions at Bible camp? Five. Five. Why aren't we training our teenagers how to do Bible studies? Someone says, well, preacher, we're losing our young people. I'm not shocked. They have no purpose. They don't know what. They, what's their mission? Do our young people know their mission is to save souls? Are we equipping them? Are we helping them learn how? Are we holding their feet to the fire? Are we asking them, who are your friends? How are you going to get to them? Have you done a Bible study? Are our young people equipped right now to do a Bible study with their friends? For the most part, the answer is no. They are not equipped. But don't worry. They're equipped. To understand the book of Ecclesiastes. We're going to have a whole Bible camp on. And I'm not opposed to Ecclesiastes. I'm all for it. We're, we're, equipped, with, we're, we're equipped with everything but soul winning. Brother, we have one mission in the church of Christ. If you take the mission out of the soldier, what do you got? If you take the mission out of the military, what do you got? A social experiment. 
you got an aimless group, a dangerous group. We have a mission. Instill that mission in your members. Your members need to understand how to use the tools that are available. And so, so if it's if it's believe the Bible, meaning that these are people who don't believe in God, how do you how do you work with somebody who doesn't believe in God? Well, we use believe the Bible, but how do I use believe the Bible? We've got to train our members how to do it. Put it in their hand. Say, okay, here's the first question and here's the answer. Let me explain it. Let's go to number two. It's just like it's just like a school. Number four, we've got to provide an atmosphere of evangelism throughout our church. In other words, it becomes and permeates through everything we touch. So everything we do at the local church becomes evangelistic. Graduation banquets, I'm not opposed to them, but they're evangelistic. Who comes to graduation banquets? Who? Prospects. Family, right? Will your family come to a graduation banquet? How about people who never come to church? Will they come? If you say, hey, grandma, and maybe she doesn't come, I'm ha- they're, they're, they're having a celebration at my church, and I'd like you to come. Do you think she'll come? How about aunt so-and-so? They're having a celebration at my church. For my- Would you come? You think she's going to come? Graduation banquets, you know, those can be evangelistic. You know, vacation Bible schools can be evangelistic. We converted two people in our last vacation Bible school in Jacksonville. And it was because we made it. I, I was when I when I sat down, my first my first thought when I sat down that first night, who's not a member of the church problem. And I went and sat mine. Hey, my name's Rob. What's your name? He says, oh, my name's Nick. Hey, Nick, you live around here? He said, well, uh, yeah. And I said, uh, well, can I ask why you're here, Nick? I said, well, I, my, bo- my boy needs to know the Bible. So I thought this man or y'all had a BBS. I decided I'd bring my boy. I said, man, Nick, I, he's a young man, you know. And I said, man, Nick, that's commendable. I said, well, um, tell me where you live here in Jackson. And we started talking. Three weeks later, I baptized he and his wife. And it's just, just again, vacation Bible school. That's evangelism. And so a lot of our vacation Bible schools, there's too much vacation and not enough Bible. All right, this is about winning souls. So, so how about your trick or trunk? Is it evangelistic? Who comes to trunk or treat or whatever you call it? Who, who, you ever line the cars up, decorate them? Y'all do that? This is a great place to do it. Line your cars up. Fill it with Reese cups. When Reese cups are seven bucks a bag, I promise you give out free Reese cups. They're coming. I promise they're going to come. And just decorate. And do you know who's going to come to that? Non Christians. So if you're. Trunk or treats about giving out candies. Well, I, I'm not for it. I'm against it. If your trunk or treat is about making contact with this community, I couldn't be more for it. So everything you do becomes about souls. Everything we do in the church becomes a, it's an atmosphere, right? So, so the church members begin to realize, hey, everything. So we're not here to shut down your programs. We're here to use those programs to bring contacts into the church. Every church has there a variety of things. They have a they have you know coat drives, backpack drives, food drives. We have turkey giveaways. I don't know what it is you guys do in this community, but whatever it is, I'm all for it. As long as you're trying to reach the lost, that's the key, right? Let me give you an example. I talk about benevolence. For a lot of preachers, benevolence is an albatross around the neck. It was for me. My last work, my full-time work at Willette, I was there about two years, and I looked at those elders, and I said, Brethren, I said, my phone rings off the the, the hook. I can't do my work. I said, uh, they're always calling and asking for help. But we put in a second line, and I'm going to ignore that line. I put an answering service on it. And they said, sure, no problem, bro. You know, I didn't even stop to think of what I was saying. I got to get back to my work. You know, I got to I got to study the Greek. I, mean, I got to get into the text, right? And I'm not opposed to getting into the text. But you know, you can get into the text. You can dig deep into the word of God and be as far from God as you've ever been. You know, that's possible. Because here are people who want to know about God, but you're too busy because you got to you got to get into the text. What's the purpose of digging into the text? Is it not to get to the people who want to know about the, the, the person, you're, the, the God you're trying to study? And here I am, I'm shutting them off. I shut them off. I literally shut them off. And I, and I, and I felt something. Man, I'm, I'm, boy, I'm really growing, you know. I'm, I'm learning. I'm learning. Oh, look at that outline. I, I alliterated it with three Ps. I mean, the brother going to love it, you know. And I got my sub points alliterated with A's. And, I, and I, man, oh, this is wonderful. The brother going to love this sermon. And they're calling here, you know, asking, you know, can you help me? 
And off, well, you know, <laughs> that's just another one of those. Well, you know, for a lot of preachers, we understand that because it's uh, we don't know what to do. So here's here's a here's a suggestion. Hello, yes, uh, my name's Rob Whitaker, preacher, Willet Church of Christ. Yes, yes, sir, we do help people. Yes, sir. What is it you need? Oh, okay, you need gas. We help with gas. You need what? Electric, but we help with electric bills. Yes, sir. Uh, car payments. Uh, yes, we help with car payments. Yes, sir. Um, uh, what is it? Oh, food. We help with food. Yes, sir. Oh, mortgage payments. Yeah, yeah, we help with mortgage payments. Whatever they ask for, I say yes. Whatever it is. And then when they're done, they're going to be excited. I promise. They're going to be excited because they have been looking for you. Sir, <laughs> well, I've been looking for this church. Sir, sir, I need help. Right? Sir, when can I get the help? 9.30 on Sunday morning, whenever it is you start, that's when you get it. 9.30, 10 o'clock Sunday morning, and we can't wait to see you. Oh, oh sir, I don't know if I can get there on Sunday morning. I don't know if I, I, don't know if I can get up that. That's okay. Because at 6 o'clock or 5 o'clock, we do it again. And we can't wait to meet you. Well, I just don't know if I can get there on Sunday. He said, that's okay. We do it at Wednesday night at 7 o'clock, and we're looking forward to meeting you. Oh, I just, I don't have a, no worries. How many of you would go pick them up? Would you? We'll send, we'll send Bill. Bill will pick you up. Oh, I, I, I just don't know if I can. Well, sir, if you want help from this church, we look forward to meeting you. You know what's going to happen to the charlatans? You know what a charlatan is, right? They're gaming you. You know what's going to happen to them? They're not coming. They're not. You're, you're, you're too much work. Because there's somebody else out there. Just give it to them. So there, but there are some, there are some seekers out there. There are legitimate people that need help. So they're going to show up at, at, at 10 o'clock, and, and as soon as they walk in, you're going to say, hey, hey, bro, um, take them to room 102 and get your wife. And go to room 102 and uh, let's do a Bible study. A Bible study. We've never done that before. I know. Can, can you do a Bible study during Bible class? Is that scriptural? Do you know I had someone raise their hand and say, I don't know, is it scriptural to do a Bible study? I mean, we're supposed to be in the Bible class. They were serious. That's the culture we've got to break. That's why we're dying. Brother, when, 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 when non-Christians walk in our door, right, and, and, and we can't go take them to room 101 and do a Bible study, there's something wrong. We should, we should be doing Bible studies with them. And then when they're finished, if they need help with their groceries, as an eldership, would you be more inclined to help someone who's completed a Bible study? The groceries, would you be more inclined to do that? I would. I'm not an elder, but I would be more inclined. Or, or maybe someone who just always runs out of gas in your parking lot. They're always heading from New York to Texas in your parking lot, and they're always a member of the church in your parking lot. Have you ever noticed they always run out of gas in Lafayette parking lot, David? Always at Lafayette to run out of gas in your parking lot. What happens when you promote that evangelistic atmosphere? Well, you take your backpack drive and it becomes evangelistic. You take your benevolent drive and teacher supply giveaway and turkey giveaways and blessing boxes and vouchers and winter coats, whatever it is you're doing, and benevolent buildings, and now it becomes an evangelistic work of the church. May I suggest, may I suggest that, uh, that there is one mission of the church and benevolence is just a tool to accomplish the mission. Brother, you are not the soup kitchen. Our job is not to solve world poverty. Jesus said the poor will always be with you. You're not going to solve world poverty in the Bay Church of Christ. And so, so your mission is to use benevolence as a what? As a tool to bring him to the Father. That's what Jesus did. And that's what we need to do. The end of your mission is not feeding them turkey on Thanksgiving. Right? That's not the end. The turkey is just a way to, to, to show them that you care. But you're really trying to get to their heart. And if you do, you get this. You get Miss Kim, who calls the building and says, Listen, uh, i got no family. And I, I, I've been dropped off by my daughter. She, she, she really doesn't have a lot to do with me. And, and I need help. Can you guys help me? Sure, we help everybody at 9.30 Sunday morning, and we can't wait to see you. Oh, I don't know if I can make it. That's okay. We do it at 10.30 again. Well, I don't have a ride. That's okay. We'll pick you up. Oh, okay. And so we picked her up. Miss Deb Rice stopped by her apartment. And she uh, picked her up and brought her to church. And 
hey, Rob, uh, we got a visitor. And Nicole and I sat with her and talked to her. Miss Kim, can we take you home? Sure. Miss Kim, I understand you need something. Yeah, I need a little grocery. I said, we've got you covered. Let's go out to eat. So we take her out to eat, take her to the uh, DG. Y'all have a DG only about every five miles in Tennessee. Dollar General. And we, we got the food, right? And so we got, got, we got to her apartment. And uh, we noticed her apartment had a lot of problems. So we set her up in another apartment. She says, Rob, how, how am I going to move? I got a bad back. I said, don't worry. I said, we've got a lot of men in our church, and they're going to pull up with their trailer Saturday morning. We're going to have you moved in about an hour. And sure enough, five men pulled up with their trucks and trailers. And we pulled everything out of that apartment. We moved her to another apartment. And the ladies came over. They're cleaning. They're setting up. She's overwhelmed by what she sees. And Nicole and I are sitting on the couch talking to her. I looked at Miss Kim. I said, Miss Kim, got a question for you. She said, what is it? I said, what do you think about the Jacksonville Church of Christ? She says, I love it. Nicest people I've ever met. I said, Miss Kim, do you know a lot about the Jacksonville Church of Christ? Well, I just moved here. Don't know a lot about you, except I like you. Miss Kim, this is question three. I always use three questions. Miss Kim, would you like to know more about the Jacksonville Church of Christ? I sure would. I just so happen to have these little books. What do you think she did when we finished our studies? You can meet her. She's a member of the Jacksonville Church of Christ. You want to know how we baptized 17 people in one year? Because I am intently focused on it. It is my mission. There is nothing more important than reaching the lost. It's more important than my office duties. It's more important than anything else that I do. In fact, when I was a full-time preacher, the members of that church knew that I, maybe I may not be at every hospital visit. Because if I have a Bible study, I'm choosing them over you. And they knew it. I tell them. In fact, they would insist me do it. Because they're saying, my neighbor's lost. The preacher can't be everywhere all the time. He has to choose what he does. Well, I'm going to choose the lost every single time. We've got to produce contacts. That's one of the steps we've got to take as a church. I, I tell you what, we have dedicated a lot of our school to this. And uh, this is very important because if you fail at this step, you fail everywhere. You could have a thousand sets of back to the Bible, but if you don't succeed here, those back to the Bibles will do you no good. Brethren, we have to generate contact. Now, I'm going to use another word. I'm going to call them customers. And I want you to understand that Walmart understands this very well. Because if Walmart does not develop customers, Walmart goes out of business. Hallmark understands it extremely well. Hallmark knows if they don't develop a customer base, they go out of business. So I'm sitting with an eldership earlier uh, last year, Painesville, Kentucky, Johnny Lamaster, former uh, professional baseball player, he's one of the elders there. And um, his, his, their preacher, Zach, and I just talked to Zach Collins today, and um, they've done extremely well. So I'm waiting for the elders. The elders walk in. We're waiting for one of the elders that's late. I said, uh, brother, is this elder coming? They said, yeah, well, he owns a couple of Hallmark stores. Man, I just changed my entire meeting right there. So I'm going to speak Hallmark. I speak Hallmark. You got a wife, you speak it too. Every husband who has a wife speaks Hallmark. So I'm sitting in the, I'm sitting in the, I'm sitting in the uh, around the table, and he comes in. I said, "Hey, brother," I said, uh, "How's your day been?" Man, it's been busy. I said, "What do you do for a living?" He says, "I own a couple of Hallmark stores." I said, "I understand." I said, uh, "I said," I told him, "I said, uh, I said, what was your day like? Is it a good day?" He said, "Yeah." I said, "What's a good day at Hallmark store?" He said, "Well." I said, how many customers you need? He said, oh, I need about 35, 40 customers. I said, okay. So you know. He says, oh, yeah. And how do you get your customers? What's the, what's the number one way you get customers? Word of mouth. So, is it the only way you get customers? He said, no. How do you get your customers? I, I advertise. And, and how do you advertise? I, I do fly. Okay, newspaper, radio, television, media, social media. And I said, I said tell me more about your store. Isn't it interesting that Walmart and Hallmark get it? They're called contacts. And brethren, if your church has no contacts, you're done. How do you get contacts into a church? How do we get them? Who's the best source of contacts we've got? Thank you. Thank you. The members. 50%.
U shape. I sat in the center, and um, I, and I said, brethren, I said, you, you got to use house to house, heart to heart. They said, Rob, we are. I said, well, great. I said, but we get nothing out of it. When they said that, I choked. Because I've been using house to house, heart to heart for 20 years, and I have baptized so many people with it. In fact, of the 17 people we baptized at Jacksonville, over half of them came from that. So I'm thinking, I said, how, how is that possible? So I began to dig into it. And I said, well, tell me about how you use it. And they said, well, we, we send it to this area this month, and this area this month. And I said, oh, that's not going to work. And that's it. So, so I started to develop how to use things. That's one of the reasons I'm here. I want to make sure that if you're going to use house to house, heart to heart, use it right. Because there's, a, there's, a, there's an effective way and an ineffective way of using it. There are 10 things you've got to know about this publication. I'm going to run through just a few of them very quickly. Number one, your front page has got to be accurate. So when I when I open up your house to house, heart to heart page number one, and I'm looking at it, and it says Lafayette Church of Christ, the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to grab that phone number I'm going to call. What am I going to get? Most of our churches I get an empty office. I don't know what I can hear. But most of our churches I get an empty office. So, so dad gets off of work, 5 o'clock, comes home, 6 o'clock, 6.30, eats a dinner, 7 o'clock. He says, oh, what is that? And he looks at it, and he's, he's thinking about it. Maybe uh, he says, you know, Saturday comes around. I'd like, to, I'd like to take my family to church. I'm going to call that number. And he calls the empty office. How many times do you think he'll call the empty office? Thank you, Tommy. One time. So whose number should be on house to house, heart to heart? Yours. Your number. They should call you and you. The elders, the preachers. We need, when, when people call, we want them to get us. I want them to talk to me. I don't want them to talk to an answering machine. I want them to talk to a human being. I want to know who they are. So there's basic things. Basic things, right? And so, so here it is. So we're going to make sure the website on there works. Half the websites I get on, they're inaccurate, don't work, and they have service times that are wrong. So I'm traveling through Alabama. I'm not going to make it home. I said, hey, kids, get on the website. Uh, 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 I think it was maybe Stevensville. I can't remember where I was. I said, type it in. So I typed in, all right, Dad, 6 o'clock. I said, Greg, out there. No, no, no service at 6. Service started at 5. I said, all right, uh, we're in trouble. <laughs> because, you know, I, I, I didn't know where to go. The website was inaccurate. So I, I test this stuff, and I said, okay, is it at the Facebook page? Is it accurate? The service times, are they accurate? Are the services are being offered, is it accurate? I and mean, there's a lot here. I don't have time to cover all of it, but I will later. What happens when you use house to house right? I'm sitting in my pew, I looked over to the corner, and I saw this lady sitting there. I've been gone three weeks. Maybe she's a new member. So Alan finishes his sermon, Alan Webster. He walks down the, the aisle, and I walk in right behind Alan. I said, Alan, who's that lady over there? And he said, Rob, I don't know. Never seen her before. She's a visitor. Yes. That's what I want. So I, I moved in behind her, and I sat right behind her. So when the closing prayer was finished, when she turned around, guess who was sitting there? And I, I said, ma'am, I'm a visitor here this morning. She said, yes. I said, well, Rob Woody, I'm just one of the members. Oh, I said, Jeff. I said, ma'am, I'm uh, I said, are you from the area? She said, yes. I said, well, what did you think of our service today? Oh, I liked it. I said, what did you like about it? Oh, I like that preacher. Boy, that preacher loves the Bible. I said, oh, yes, Alan loves the Bible. And I said, yes, man. He quotes a lot of Bible verses. I said, he loves to quote Bible verses. And uh, I said, man, would you buy your son? Well, I wouldn't know. Well, my husband got sick. I, I, he was coming, but he got sick. And I had to take him home. And I said, well, I'd like to meet him. I said, my wife is visiting her mom this morning. I said, Tell you what, I, I, I sure would like you to meet my wife. She said, well, I'll tell you what, I'll come back tonight. Got an evening service. Glad we weren't closed. I said, absolutely. I said, we have one at 6 o'clock. For some reason, and I don't understand why, some of our churches are dismissing all of their services. It's like more faith equals less worship. I don't understand what strategy that is. I'm still trying to figure it out. I still believe the more we worship and study, the stronger we are. But uh, we'll talk about that later. 
And so anyway, we were, she, she comes back. She brings, her, she brings her husband back, right? And there he is. And Nicole and I walked over. We introduced ourselves, and we're talking. And I said, hey, we've got this little custom. You know what the custom is? Anybody know what the custom is? What is it? Thank you. I said, hey, I said, I've got this little custom. We always take visitors out to eat. What's your favorite restaurant, uh, Perry? He said, I'll, uh, Fino's. I like a Fino's. I said, you know, Fino's a little pricey, but it's good food. <laughs> and I said, um, I said, I tell you what, we'll take you to the Fino's. Really? I said, sure. And he said, well, man, if I'm going to go to a Fino's, I don't want to eat. My stomach's a little queasy. Can I take a rain check? I said, what well, next? No. Let's try Tuesday. I said, sounds good. Tuesday, we met at the Fino's. I made reservations. We walked in, we sat around that little table. I could care less about the lasagna. I have one mission. There is one thing I want, gentlemen, and I will get it. I said, and I'm strategizing the entire time. Right, David? You want one thing. And I'm sitting around that table, I want Bible study. And I'm looking for it. But I can't ask for a study. You never ask for Bible study. But I'll find it. And we're talking, and I'm looking for a sweet spot. I said, hey, Perry. I said, yeah, what do you like? And he said, yeah. I said, you like NFL football? He says, no, I don't watch that stuff anymore. I said, me. I said, Perry, what do you like? Baseball? And I'm a little slow. I said, I don't care. Um, basketball? I said, well, Perry, what do you like? He says, all right. Go Alabama. <laughs> I said, go Alabama. I said, I said, oh, Nick Saban, Rob, greatest coach in the history of the world, Rob. You know, championships and all. I mean, we're, yes, go Saban. And we got a statue on it, no doubt. And uh, so, I mean, we're talking all about, you know, football and Nick Saban. And I said, Perry, I said, what a terrible year this has been for you. I said, y'all didn't make the championship game. And he said, oh, Rob, it's been terrible. And I said, Perry, do you know tomorrow is the national championship game? And, uh, or was next week or something like that. And he said, yeah. I said, do you know? I said, Perry. I said, uh, we're going to have a football party in our house. And you're invited. Ah, what was that? That was my wife kicking me because she did not know about it. And um, and and, uh, and so and so it hurt to me to kick you in the shin. And um, I said, yes, Perry, you and Ellen are coming on over. And uh, we got a big screen. A big old screen. I said, we got surround sound. And we'll have chips and dip. And, uh, you know, the, what the croissant rolls that put the little hot dogs in them. Those are really good stuff. Sausage balls, chips, and dip, good stuff. He said, honey, can we go to the waiter's house? I thought we were in fifth grade. It was wonderful. They came over. They're sitting in my living room. How many missions do I have, by the way? Help me. Four. One. I have one. We're watching the football game. It, it, it's a blowout. So I, I looked over at uh, I looked over at Perry. I said, Perry, let's turn this down and call. I said, I just have a Man, I just something bothering me. He said, what is it? I said, well, man, there's a dozen churches in Jacksonville. What the odds are to show up at the Jacksonville Church of Christ? Kind of conversational, isn't it? I just want to know. I'm opening the door. He'll walk in. And he said, uh, well, he said, you know, Rob, we're Methodist. I said, oh. He said, you know, the Methodists are struggling right now. I said, well, with, with, what with? He said, well, I got men getting married, women getting married. He said, I don't like that. Not very biblical. And he said, now we tried the Baptist, but you know, I don't know if we, I don't know about that either. And I said, Perry, what do you think about the Will at Church? I have three questions, y'all remember? What do you think about the Will at Church Christ? He said, well, I like it so far. Do you know a lot about us? Not really. Would you like to know more? Sure would. Anybody want to finish my line? I just so, I just so happen to have these three little bullets. Three weeks. 90% of the time they're baptized. Can you do that? You can. All of you guys can do this. This is not that hard. Mr. Fowler has done it a few dozen times. They just have them over to the house, take them out to eat, baptize 26 people in a year. It's exciting. That's how churches grow. This is right there, God. Right here, back page, right there. What do you have to do? You gotta promote your church. I mean, you gotta promote this church. You gotta put stuff on there that's green people. I tell you what I put on there. I put on there, um, I put on there uh, truck or treat. They're gonna come to Cajun Bible School, they're gonna come to backpack drive. You're gonna give out free backpacks to the kids, they're gonna come. Can I tell you about our last backpack drive? Oh, that's good. Knoxville, Tennessee, Carnes Church of Christ. Anybody ever heard of the Carnes Church of Christ? Steve Higginbottom? 
So I, we showed up there. We're gonna we're gonna do a we're gonna do a backpack drive. We're doing a big old campaign. And, and uh, I asked the elders. I said, can you can you plug us in a backpack drive? And sure. We're gonna put one of our deacons in. I said, great. I got there, man. They were they were they're like Chick Fil A. I mean, they had it on me. Man, when the members put their mind to something, there's nobody better in the world. I mean, we had the backpacks lined up, and man, we and and, and I said, well, explain to me how you're going. Now, Rob, we're very efficient here. He said, we're going to have them drive under the arm. We're going to have a cart with all the backpacks on it. And he says, and as they drive up, we're going to give them the backpack, of course. There'll be a flyer about the church. Give it to them, and we're just going to funnel them on through. And he said, I believe we can pass out four or five hundred backpacks. I said, uh, could, could I uh, suggest maybe another alternative? And he said, well, what, what do you think? And I said, I think we should put the backpacks in the Bible classrooms. I said, well, I think we should make them come into the building. And I think we should have an open house. And I think the members should show up and tour the people around through the church building. And I think the teachers should decorate their classrooms. And I think they should turn the lights on. And I think they should have big smiles on their face. And I think they should greet the children in the appropriate age classroom. And I think they should introduce themselves to the teacher where they would attend, when they come, they will. And then we're going to give them a backpack in the classroom. And we're going to take a picture, right, and give them a photo or something. And we're going to, then we're going to take them to an information station. We're going to make this a 30-minute per family adventure. We baptized. We had a Bible study that night. And they had baptized and baptized and baptized. Maybe we should stop trying to be efficient. Maybe we should try to talk to people about the Lord. Advertise your events. You know, every time a house to house goes out, uh, there are free offers inside. And uh, so, what happens when someone calls? Can you? I like to have that Ten Commandment. Are they right? I like to get you to send me that Ten Commandment poster. Well, you do. Well, you send them the Ten Commandment. No, you don't send them the Ten Commandment poster. You show up at the door and you bet by set. That's what you do. You make personal contact. That's Daniel and Brenda. When I got to the door and she opened it up, my wife was standing right next to me. I, I never go to the door alone. Men never go to the door alone. Men, you never go to the door alone. Ever. So my wife's sitting next to me. She, she, uh, when she saw my wife, she opened the door immediately. And, uh, and then I mean, Man, my name is uh, Rob, and, and this is my wife, Nicole. And you Brenda? Yes. I said, you requested a Ten Commandment poster. Yes, I did. And you requested some marriage. Oh, yes. yes, yes. Man, did you just get married? I did. I did. And I thought maybe I, this would help me. I said, wonderful. I said, I, I'm so glad. And, and how long have you been here? Oh, about a month. How long have you been married? About a month. And I said, okay. I said, ma'am. I said, uh, I said uh, are you familiar with Jacksonville? No, no, no. I didn't, didn't grow up in this area. And I said, oh. She said, sir, I got a question for you. I said, yeah. She said, um, do you know anything about the Bible? You could have blown me over. I said, ma'am, I know a little bit about it. She said, well, good, because my husband knows nothing about the Bible. Daniel, get off the couch. That man has been on the couch ever since he came home from work. I don't know what he does all day. He just sits there when he gets home. Daniel, get up. There are people here to meet you. She is very young. Uh, she is very direct. And she brings Daniel out of the couch. Daniel's doing this. And she brings Daniel over. And she says, Daniel, we three are going to teach you about the Bible. I said, man, when do you want to start? She said, what about tomorrow? I said, you need the time. And my wife will bring chocolate chip cookies. I love Bible studies because I get chocolate chip cookies. And, um, and so in any case, um, we, we, uh, oh, we just get that time. Oh, I love Bible studies. You've got to create a target list. You'll never hit a target if you don't aim for it. You've got to knock doors at least once a year. What's, what, what do you think our success rate is at the door? Just guess. What do you think our success rate in our school is at the door? Guess. You won't hurt my feelings. Take a guess. How many percent? I hit 100 doors. What's my percentage of success? Four. One? Ten? Anybody else? So we have a 33% success rate at the door. You won't believe me. I know you don't believe me, but we do. And I've proven it every single year. And if you'll do what we teach you to do, your percentage will go from one to two, because that's normal. Who said one? Who, was that you, brother? You, that's about normal. We went from one to two 
to 30 to 35. You say, how did you do that? Well, fasten your seatbelt. You're going to learn how. Because that's what we're here for. We're going to teach you how to get that 35%. So, new movers. How many new movers? How, how many new people are moving into this area every month? About 36. 36? The last three months has been 60. I got the latest list. It's popped. I don't know why. 36 or 60, here's the point. You guys are growing. Where are they coming from? Probably trying to get out of the cities. Right? That's what our cities are emptying the populations and they're heading from the bay, right? Get ready. Let's get ready. People are coming. So when a person comes and they move in, when a person moves in, what are they? They're a target. They're a target. That's what they are. People are most likely to change churches when they move. A couple of generations ago, when a couple or a family or an individual moved from one city to another city, they usually stayed with that same denomination. Those days are over. It doesn't matter to me what denomination they were in in the last town. Your average person today is willing to look at any church in their neighborhood. It doesn't matter to me what church they were part of in the last town. I want them to visit the church of Christ. So right now, my wife is teaching your ladies how to go shopping in the name of the Lord. Ladies like to shop all the time, but in the name of the Lord, that's the most exciting thing they've ever done. It's God authorized. They can look at their husband and say, God told me to go shopping, and they're going. And so, so you're not stopping me. And so we're going to send them to the store, and they're going to do things that you don't want to do. And you're not good at it. Send me to the store to make a new mover basket, and it'd be a disaster. Send my wife to the store to master. And we're going to make these new mover baskets, and we're going to, we're going to, they're, they're going to make the new mover baskets, and they're going to have all, you, you're going to send your widow ladies on a Monday morning with the church credit card to the dollar store. I promise they can buy the whole store, you still have money left. And so, well, it's a dollar twenty-five now. But anyway, you're going to go to the dollar store, and you're going to buy those new mover baskets, right? And, and we're going to assemble those, those widows will love you for it. They're going to love it, because they're participating. No, they're not going to go door knocking, but they'll make the basket. Let them. Oh, but we got a secretary. They, David's wife can go. I don't want Kelly doing it. Let the widows do it. Get them involved. Let somebody else do it. I can do it in 10 minutes. I don't want you to do it in 10 minutes. Well, take them four hours. Let it take them four hours. And they're going to love you for it. And we're going to, we're going to teach you how to do that right there. That is effective. We've done it right. One of the advantages we have is that after doing this for 10 years and having a full-time school for four and a half, I know things that you shouldn't do. Let me tell you the number one thing you shouldn't do when you go to the door. This is your list. Of course, my wife doesn't mean they open it. Bill Smith? Yes. Did you just, I think you just moved here, right, Bill? How, how, where'd you get my name? How do you know who, who, who are you? Where'd you get, who, who, where'd you get my name from? You are dumb. You're dumb. You never do that. You never use their name. You never have a piece of paper in your hand. They immediately think you're about to steal their entire bank account. Okay? This one too. Uh, my name's Robin. Welcome to Cole. We're, we're members of this community. Uh, we understand you just moved in and we wanted to welcome you. And uh, we, we're, we're just trying to get out and meet our neighbors. My wife and I have lived here about 15 years. We've got children in the local school. We thought we'd just kind of find out a little bit more about you. And, uh, is there anything we can do for you? And, uh, oh, by the way, we've got this uh, basket here of things. We thought it might help you. My wife made us some chocolate chip cookies, and, and they're, man, they're warm still. Oh, really? And what's your, uh, my, my wife's name is Nicole. Hey, man, I love that American flag you got on the corner there. Man, we need patriotic people today. Our country's in a mess right now. And, uh, hey, what's your dog's name? Oh, Fluffy. Man, I had a little Fluffy when I was growing up. How old's your dog? And what kind of dog is that? And I'll tell you what, I, I, hey, by the way, uh, we've got a little piece of paper in there that talks about the local services. Uh, it's hard to find it. You know, i tell you what, it's hard to find even the trash pickup on the internet. And I said, we can put the number down for you there. And, uh, and hey, hey, you guys have a church home here? We, we, there's a good church right down the road. And uh, um, i tell you what, uh, we'll come back in a couple weeks and maybe tell you a little bit more about it. And uh, maybe we could visit sometime. Oh, that'd be so nice. 35% success rate. I have videos, and I'm going to show you exactly how to do what I just did. 35% of the time, I'll get success. It's rare that someone slams the door on me. It happens, but it's rare. Very rare. 
And I'm going to take that contact I just made and I'm going to add it to my compassion card group. Now, compassion cards are not just some random card writing of five people. It's a congregational card writing app. And everybody writes cards. And um, you're going to send out 100 cards a week. I'm talking lots of cards for church this time. You're going to blanket this. You're going to take 10, 15 contacts and just cover them up with cards. And uh, in fact, the uh, top salesman in the United States of America, he's an automobile salesman. He's always number one, his dealership. And uh, Consumer Reports, I don't read Consumer Reports. I don't know what I'm talking about. They, they rank very, okay. And I read an article, this is years ago, and uh, they went to interview this guy. And they said, hey, how are you always the top um, car rep? How, how do you always become the top number one car rep every year selling automobiles? He says, it's simple. It's one word, cars. So he took the cameras back into the dealership. And he says, come back here. And they opened the door, and in that door were eight to ten widow ladies. You know what they did all day, every day? Cards. They just write cards. They hand write cards to people in the community. You know what the power of the handwritten card does? What if someone visited this church? What if a new mover moved in, <coughs> in a new mover basket, and had a good ten minute conversation, very friendly, and you put them on your contact list, and everybody in this church, maybe 15 cards, 20 cards went to them this week. And you said two on Monday, two on Tuesday, two on Wednesday, two on Thursday, two on Friday, two on Saturday. And you overwhelmed them with cards. Maybe you did it for two weeks, three weeks, four weeks. And then you went back and visited. You think you're going to have a good visit? You think they're going to slam the door in your face and say never come back again? You know what happens when you love people? You know what happens when you kind people? You know what happens when you, when you show them the spirit of Christ? I know it's unconventional. So we send cards. Who do we normally send cards to? Sick. Yeah, try. What kind of sick? Our sick. Our sick. We send them to our people. And we say, well, brother, we're going to send cards. You know, brother so-and-so, brother Frank's been sick. We're going to send him cards. I'm sure you appreciate every card you get, brother Frank. But this is what I know about brother Frank. If he gets zero cards or 20 cards, he'll be back. But that new liberal will never come here with that card. We're inward focused. We're keepers of the accord. We're not fishing for men. We gotta take that neighbor of yours that's got cancer, and we gotta cover them up with cards. We gotta get our ladies to go bring bread. We got these get these young men right here. Bring your rakes and trash bag. Rake the lead, don't even ask. Just go rake them. Go rake them. Now go knock on the door. Give it about three weeks, not on the door. What kind of conversation are you going to have? Pretty good. What are the three questions you're going to ask, by the way? Hey, what do you think about the LeVay Church of Christ? What do you think you're going to say? I like them. Man, those young people came over. Or you, you, you raked my yard, you know? Take those young people and go rake leaves. Take those young people somewhere and go wash a car. Go clean a house. Go, go do some good some good deed. Give them a purpose and a mission. You'll say souls. Her name's Tina. See what she's holding up? What she holding up, fellas? What she got in her hand? Guess where she got it from? Jacksonville Church of Christ covering her up. When I walked into her apartment that day, I said, but Tina, I said, you've got a car factory in here. <laughs> I said, where did they come from? That church of yours, Rob, that Jacksonville. Man, I get three or four cards a day. You know, what do you think about the Jacksonville Church of Christ? I love it. Do you know a lot about the Jacksonville Church of Christ? Don't know a lot. Would you like to know more about it? I sure would. I just so happen to have these little moments. I'll never forget the last Bible study we had with Patina. I'll never forget this. I don't think it would ever happen again. I'm sitting there in Mark 16, 16, and I normally, it doesn't matter whose turn it is to read, I have them read it. Because they don't, they've never read this before. You'd be shocked. And I said, Bettina, would you read Mark 16, 16? She, oh, I know what that verse says. That's what she did do. So she looked up at me. He that believes is saved and baptized. I've never heard of that verse before. So I looked at Bettina. I said, Bettina, would you, would you read it again? Oh, sure. He that believes is saved and baptized. Right back my pastor told me all about that verse. I'm sure he has. I said, Bettina, here's what we're going to do. I want you to, I want you to read it like one word at a time. 
How many of you get the birthday card from the insurance agent? How many get the, raise your hand. How many get the Christmas card? You ever get a Christmas card from your insurance agent? What do you do with that card? You frame it, put it on the refrigerator, goo over it every day, or you put it in the trash can? You know what they're going to do with the handwritten card? Goo over it every day. And they read it and read it and read it. There's a difference. What happens when you do those kind of things? You baptize. This is one of the 17. Cameron and Lindsay. I'll never forget uh, when I first met them. I walked into the church building. We've been gone a while. I saw this couple sitting on the back row. And I walked up to one of our members. He's supposed to be taking care of visitors. Hey, brother, I said, who got back here? Oh, oh I, they've been coming. Why have you been gone, Rob? I said, who, who are they? Oh. Uh, can't, can't, can't. I, I, I can't remember. I said, I've got the, the car. Here we throw the car out. Oh, oh. Now we give him the visitor. But we were waiting for you, Rob. And I do this. I go around. I'm going to find the people that we gave responsibility to. I'm going to see if you're doing your job. They weren't doing their job. None of them did. So I walked up to the family. I did it myself. And Nicole and I sat with them. We did. We introduced them to our new preacher. His name's Keith Ritchie. Y'all know Keith Ritchie? Anybody know Keith? Godly man. I walked up to Keith Ritchie. I said, Keith, you don't know this family. And that's Cameron and Lindsay. They're visiting. Say no more. He looked at me. I said, I know what you're going to say before you say it. Give me the card. He walks up to him, and that very day he's taking him to eat. And on Monday, he's got his first Bible study. Guess what he did three weeks later? He better. You gotta take people out to eat. You gotta take people out to eat. Eat, eat, and eat. That is the formula for success in evangelism. Food. Digital media. Work. There's a lot you can do with digital media. I don't have time. Um, community outreach, uh, not hot dogs and hamburgers, but alligator sausage and a shrimp boil will bring them in. We baptize the whole thing. So we've got to understand the purpose of the church is to what? Save souls. That's the purpose. Our purpose is to save souls. To this intent that now the principalities and powers in heavenly places, it might be made known by the church, the manifold wisdom of God. So everything we do is about leading souls from people in the pews that have been in our pews for 10 years and never obeyed the gospel to compassion cars, to visitors, door knocking, house to house, heart to heart, new movers, digital media, benevolence. Everything we do is about reaching lost people. We are not the Rotary Club. We are an army of soul leaders. And our churches need to understand that. Is there a more potent body in the world to win souls than the Church of Christ? No. Did not the Lord Jesus make the church to win souls? Brother, do you believe that? I do. I believe we were made to be a soul winning army, Tommy. I believe that's why we exist. And if that's not why this church exists, sell the building and go home. Because we're no better than the light. Our job is to reach the lost. Do you believe that, Brother Reed? I do. We got to populate our list. <laughs> Mount Pleasant Church of Christ, 19 baptisms in one year from the members because they did it right. Everybody's got to participate, youngest to the oldest. For the body is not one member but many. By the way, that elder spoke at PTP last year. If you don't believe me, go listen to him. Bring him up. Just listen to him what they did. Took a church that had no baptisms the year before to 19 in one year. Amazing. The body's not one member, but many. Hands and eyes. Not everybody has to lead a Bible study. Not everybody has to break leaves. Not everybody has to go shopping for new mover baskets. Not everybody has to, not everybody has to uh, uh, knock a door. We've got to do something. We've got to prioritize it and make it the most important mission of the church. It's more important than asphalt and repairs and paint and I don't know, I talked to a preacher this morning. I'll just give you his first name is Greg. And Greg's trying to train his church out to be so winners. He said, I got about half of them on board. He said, so we showed up for Transition Thursday, Mission Monday. Rob, and man, we're, gonna, we're getting ready to really go after it. And I, and I, I finished, and about seven or eight of the men, they're standing back there, and they said, we're going to go uh, spray for bugs, Greg. Bugs? 
Hannah I said, uh, you know, our hands kind of hurt when we write these cards. We're going to paint too. Our hands kind of hurt. We're going to paint too. All right? And he said, so, so we had seven or eight men go out there, and they're going to paint the walls, and the rest of us are going to work on souls. He said, Rob, I was furious. We came together to reach the lost, and we're going to go, we're going to go spray for bugs. I don't think I have to say any more, do I? That's not our mission. I, mean, I know I think we need to spray for bugs, but not, not, not on mission Monday. That's not the mission of the church. Number nine. Publicize your mission. Elders, get up there and talk to the church and tell them what their mission is. Let them know we need you. We need your help. And this is what we're going to do. Lead your church. Number 10, pray for the lost. Pray for them by the I'll never hit a target you don't need Brother, thank you for your kind attention tonight. I went way beyond my allotted time. And uh, I just couldn't stop. But you were welcome to leave if you wanted. Uh, but I love what I do, and I know that you love souls, and that's why you're here. Brethren, you can grow. <clears throat> I'm going to get the number here. 48% of our churches last year enrolled in our school hit their 10% mark. 10% of 120 is 12. That, was my, that would be my goal, hit 12 baptisms. So 47% of our churches hit we had about 5% of our churches hit over 20%. One church hit 27%. Riverbend hit 25, 26%. So you can do it. Woodstock hit 19%. Woodstock's not far from here. They hit 19%. They, they, man, they were on fire baptizing people. And you go talk to their elders. Ask Matt Amos what happened after they enacted this stuff. It changed their entire church. So, so you guys can do it. doesn't matter if you're, you're visiting preacher, visiting members. Take, let me know. I'll, I'll set you up. Let's get busy. What I want to do is give you the actionable curriculum. This stuff will not work if you don't have the, the strategy. And I can give it to you. I can help you step by step. And uh, we have a web-based actionable curriculum. It takes you step by step. It's incredible. We spent a year designing it. And um, it, is, it is an amazing, amazing um, I think uh, step leap forward for our school, helping elders and preachers carry this out. So if you're if you're not a member of this church, you want to know more information, you can see my son Jerry, see Austin. Austin is Austin still here, Jerry? See Austin, he'll be glad to talk to you. We'll get we'll get your information. But we're going to spend a few minutes with the elders here and preacher. We're going to talk about how they can work with faith. That's exciting. Thank you for being here. God bless each one of you. Let's pray. Our Father, we're thankful for the opportunity to be together. Father, we're thankful for this church. We're thankful, Father, for soul winning. Bless these elders. Bless for the David Payton. Bless the members and deacons and every, everyone, Father, that's here. May we be reminded of our mission. May we, Father, work. Father, may we do as Jesus said. Work while it's called today for a night comes when no man can work. Help us lift up our eyes and look on the fields. For they are widened to harvest. And it's a blitna, a bayon, and all areas surrounding. Help us reach the lost. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.